Welcome to In Early, the crypto podcast, where I speak to those at the forefront of the digital asset space, telling real life stories, discussing the growth and growing pains of the industry, and exploring how blockchain technology has made an impact on people's lives. My name is Matt Green, and I'm the blockchain litigation lead at Shoesmiths. This episode features Ben Appleby, founder and CEO of The Cake, a decentralized support platform for the crypto ecosystem. We find out more about Ben, who says he was the first person in Europe to use a Bitcoin ATM, what he got up to in Parliament, his position on DAOs and decentralized apps and what they are, as well as why he set up The Cake, what it stands for, his plans for tokenization, and what his favorite decentralized project is, amongst other things. I hope you enjoy. So I'd like to introduce this week, Ben Appleby, founder and CEO of The Cake. How you doing? You all right? Yes, Matt. Good to see you. Like really amped to come and talk to you today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm really excited to have you. And, and let's just get straight into it. I just want to talk about sort of you first. Um, how did you get into the world of blockchain and crypto? Oh man, it's been a long time now. <laughs> uh, I've been in crypto since about 2013 and uh, a friend of mine told me about it and it was one of those friends that when they say things you listen if it would have been somebody else it might not have triggered that spark who was it it's my friend martin he's my best mate we've been best mates for years right he's a real techie geek as well but he does the like web hosting side of things and i was always a web designer so we always kind of like aligned he's always hosting my websites and he hears about tech stuff but never really sort of goes down the rabbit hole whereas i'm the kind of guy that will just get something and then I want to like get one over on him. So I'll go back and go, oh, what about (laughs) this, what about that? So I started researching Bitcoin in 2013. And as soon as I started reading about it, I was like, oh my God. And I just got it. And it takes a long time for a lot of people to kind of get things. But the way my brain works is that I can just visualize and map things out almost instantly. I can see this triage picture just, you know, above my eyes. And I was like, Mm. oh, wow. And then as you do more research, you start looking at all the different kind of elements of it. And I just kept coming back to it and learning more. And for anybody that's sort of done any Bitcoin research, you realize that, oh my God, what have I, what have I come into? What, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. It's a Pandora's box and I'm still learning about it now. Yeah. And you could study Bitcoin for years and still not know all of it. So it's just one of those things that is, you know, super, super interesting and just started trying it really. And I think that's one of the things that, people don't do when they get into crypto they might buy a bit of bitcoin and leave it on an exchange but that's not the big picture the big picture is actually having your own wallet and trying it i was buying my breakfast with bitcoin in 2000 you're buying your breakfast yeah what was for breakfast um it was always a a cheese croissant and a coffee (laughs) and i have this documented and you know the guys that were putting the transaction through were doing it on an iPad, and I was using Blockfolio app and scanning it. Who were you doing it with? Who was the merchant? This was at Nim Sum Soup in Old Street. Okay, are um, they still going? Yeah, they're still we, there. we should try and go there afterwards. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> they had one of the Satoshi Point Bitcoin ATMs in there as well. Nice. And because it was like kind of shortage, you know, Old Street area, there's a lot of sort of tech there. Um, and funnily enough, I claim. I believe, and I'd like somebody to challenge me on this, is that I was the first person in Europe to use a Bitcoin ATM. How can we prove that? We've got to find some evidence somewhere. Like it's on the blockchain, I've surely. Got, like I've got pictures with timestamps on them, and I docu- I, obviously I documented, you know, that process. I documented yeah. the breakfast buying process. So you can kind of zoom in and see how much I was paying for coffee and and croissants at that time, <laughs> and you can work it out. And you're yeah. like, oh god. So uh, it seems as though. People I speak to, you're you're one of these sort of earliest people in this whole world. Is it because of your genuine interest? Is it because you just sort of fell into it? It it just seems like everyone's quite new and yet you've been around for a while. Yeah. So when I was a kid, I used to, you know, take apart radios. I wanted to see how they were. Or one of those guys. One of those guys. (laughs) (laughs) So when, you know, my sister's like, where's my radio? He's like, oh, I don't know. (laughs) It might be in pieces. And obviously I never fixed them and put them back together. I just wanted to see what was inside them. Right, Um, okay. And that's sort of part of my nature. And that's why I love tech. I love gadgets. And that's why I think I've been quite successful as a kind of, you know, digital product designer, um, because I like figuring out how stuff works. Well, that sort of brings me to the next question, because, I mean, I had a look at your 
CV, I suppose your LinkedIn, and I'm just going to read out some terms and I just sort of want to understand what these mean. So your previous uh, titles have been Web3 CX designer, Web3 UX R&D consultant, and now you're a Web3 UX research and designer at BYND. Yeah. What, is, what does that mean for so, people who may not understand? It sounds like jargon, right. So <laughs> we'll start with the first one, Web3 CX designer. So yeah. the first bit, Web3, is really the new type of internet era that we're in. So web one was about publishing content, web two was about social content, and web three is about ownable content. And so that's what the web three stands for. And really, because I usually, I get most of my work through LinkedIn, I've mm. got a good reputation there with recruiters. Um, I put that on my profile so they know that I'm at the cutting edge of that design phase. And if they want blockchain, they're going to be thinking Web3. So that's handy for me to have. Just at that point, is Web3 in your mind sort of the overall word to describe blockchain and crypto and metaverse? Because these these terms seem to be interchangeable and mm -hmm. the people I've spoken to sort of don't really have an overarching term for it all. So just at that point that you're describing, is Web3 your sort of catch-all term for it? It's a convenient term that sort of captures <laughs> it. And obviously three is better than two. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> Completely makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. Um, the next bit of the title, Web3 CX is on. So CX is stands for customer experience, and then UX stands for user experience. So if you're if you do a job that's in retail with like FMCG, mm -hmm. or for example, I did some services on with B and Q, I'll put that as CX. So again, recruiters know that I've done retail, right. customer led user experience design, and then designer. That's just basically drawing grey boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes colouring them in. Sometimes colouring them in, if I'm lucky, yeah. So does that mean that you have specialist knowledge and training? Um, training, no, not really. Like, I left school at 15. Right. I was a chef. I was self-taught. I went and, you know, bought myself a computer, went and taught myself web design. So I guess all the training that I've done has been off my own back. Um, kind of funny story, actually, when the internet was just kind of just becoming popular, kind of like circa 95, like Windows 95 era. Um, we didn't have internet. We weren't allowed it because it was far too expensive. Yeah. And so every time my parents were out, I had a really long phone cable and I'd run out and plug it in and then plug it into my Windows 95, gung, 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 gung <laughs> dial up. And I was like, oh my God, the internet. And as soon as that happened, I was like, do you know what? Like I didn't really get on very well at school because it just didn't work for me sitting under fluorescent lights and yeah. like being told to sit still. But when I had the internet, I was like, oh my God, like I can teach myself anything I want. And there were no rules, you know, this is on my terms. And that was really what kind of got me into kind of web design and then content strategy and UX design. And that was, yeah, where it all started. So that freedom to be able to teach yourself meant that you were able to then sit down and sort of concentrate on, on those things. There are alignments here, right? Yeah. Freedom of information, freedom of access, and then Bitcoin, freedom of, of finance. Right. So there's definitely a bit of a kind of libertarian- <laughs> It's a common thing. Kind yeah. of like punk ethos, yeah. you know, that underpins that. And I was a punk when I was in my teens as well. So I did look at, you know, bigger systems and question them. Yeah. Um, and I think Bitcoin does that. And so when I started learning about it, that came from a kind of cypherpunk kind of background. And so I really sort of like resonated with the things that they were talking about. Okay, well, that's that's one of the sort of common themes in this is sort of relatively anti-establishment libertarian sort of movement. And Bitcoin was the first that sort of sprung from that. So, I mean, it, it, that all makes complete sense to me. And on the flip side of that, you visited parliament early this year, didn't you? <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about that and what what that was, what that meant, what you were doing there, who you spoke to? Oh, it was great. Yeah, it was really special. Um, so obviously, I've picked up a lot of contacts and and, and people within my network over the years, uh, and got. I was actually at, at Magna Carta Island um, at a conference, um, and at that kind of conference, I was invited to the House of Parliament, which was great. There was there was uh, um, a debate going on there. And it was really kind of surreal having like, you know, a full English breakfast to a kind of stringed quartet on the Thames. <laughs> Isn't that how you normally have breakfast? Every day now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah. Back, but yeah. Paying with everything in Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, there was no choice or questions like, are you vegan or not? It's like, you know, full English breakfast, black pudding, the whole works, you know. Sorry, that was in Parliament? That was in Parliament, yeah. They don't give you a choice? No, no, it was just like, there it is, you know, silver served. Okay, well, yeah, know. the swings and roundabouts and that silver served, but no <laughs> vegetarian option, yeah. right? So. Um, and there was a, a baroness there who actually had a really cool story about 
she was a um, Im- an immigrant to the UK, um, and her son was was uh, disabled. He wasn't able to speak, and she'd been to the hospital with him. Um, and they were like, "Well, yeah, sorry, we can't do anything." And she was like, "No, like mm. you can get Stephen Hawking to talk. Like, make the tech." And so that was her backstory. And I was like, wow, what a powerful story. And so she kind of like leads tech and innovation from the core, from parliament, and had a chat with her afterwards, told her about the cake. And she was like, that's a brilliant idea. Let's mm. let's touch base. Um, and then, yeah, had another um, uh, event at the House of Commons, which was with an MP. This was a far more a debating kind of a session where we're talking about um, connected blockchains, and the metaverse. Um, yeah, and the MPs there were really encouraging. Um, it was really nice to kind of like be in there and listen to how pretty clued up they are on this tech. Are you surprised that they're clued up? I was surprised. Because I'm surprised that some of the judges are really clued up in my world of law. Yeah. They, they seem to really take an active interest in it. Yeah, no, this, this, this guy, uh, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, but he was kind of, he had a lot of experience with artificial intelligence. Right. And so he, we were meleeing with, you know, AI, blockchains, metaverse, and it was a brilliant like debate. Yeah. Um, and there's also the APPG, which is a kind of blockchain parliamentary um, party. Um, and that is something that, you know, if people want to get involved in that kind of stuff, that's definitely worth checking out. You can go to parliament, you can be involved in the in the debates, you can, you know, add your point of view. Is that how you were invited under, under that? Yeah, yeah. Um, is it policy shaping? Is what what are they doing it for? To gather ideas, yeah, to, yeah, to to just listen to the public on experts, or there are agendas that are being put forward. There's legislation that are, that's being outlined, um, mm-hmm. but generally it feels like, well, I don't know whether it's just that I've managed to kind of like <laughs> sounds negative in, infiltrate that network, <laughs> <laughs> or whether it is the fact that the government are more open to this. You know, there's been a lot of stuff in the press about. Um, you know, Britain being, you know, the center, you know, of blockchain for the world. And that's fantastic. So you mm-hmm. hear that stuff and you go, great, let's see the goods. Yeah, what are we what are we doing? And then a couple of weeks later, you're in, you're in Parliament, you know, talking to MPs about it. And you're like, okay. Um, and, you know, the Royal Mint, for example, you know, they're yeah. going to be minting NFTs. And there was a lot of really negative trolling on Twitter about that. And I was like, guys, like... They're, they're taking steps forward. Yeah, they're swimming it's in the, the right world. direction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the right direction. You're always so. going to have people who are negative, right? Yeah. Always. Um, I mean, there are consult there are consultations um, out there about DAOs. I know the, the the there are consultations about NFTs, and they're asking certainly lawyers about how we shape that industry. So I guess that there are positive steps being taken, and, and seemingly in that respect, we are going in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, one of the first things that I did when Liz Truss was, you know, given the seat of prime minister mm. is to check, you know, will she support this movement that was initiated before her? Mm. Um, and she does. She was like, yep, I love what you guys are doing. So for me, I'm kind of really proud of that. Um, and Britain's always been a nation of, you know, innovators and financial innovators as well. So for mm-hmm. me, I'm proud of that. I want to be a part of that. Um I tell you who has been really big is Matt Hancock. I've seen him around yeah, a lot of different exactly. different places. Yeah. I know that there was the the uh, Global Crypto Club, which so is Club a, Global, yeah, 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 which opened, and he was. I was sitting a couple of seats away from him, and he was at dinner, and he was talking, and very eloquent, and really pushing the agenda. He's done a lot of tech, uh, and he gets it, um, and that's really reassuring because a lot of people in the space don't, mm. and there's a lot of BS. Uh, and oh yes, I've got a very very heightened BS detector. Well, um, thank you for coming today then. <laughs> Pre- appreciate it. It's like, do how much do I trust Matt? I think I trust Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Come down and just record something. We'll we'll, we'll talk and find out. Yeah. Um, well, Matt, you're, you're trusted. You're, you're a trusted advisor on the cake. Yeah. Well, no mean feat. So. <laughs> we'll come to that in a minute, we'll but thank you. So I, again, I was sort of scrolling through your LinkedIn and it says DAP slash blockchain. Yeah. Can you describe what DAP is? Absolutely, yeah. So, well, let's let's kind of reverse engineer it and and just sort of clarify what an app is. Mm. So, an app is something that you install on your phone. And really, apps do very similar things to web apps, which are websites basically. Mm-hmm. Um, the only difference is is that once it's installed, it's a reminder that it's there, and it's quicker to open. And so, and you know, historically, they had slightly better access to the hardware on your device. But essentially, it's it. For a hundred actions or a thousand actions that you might do on your phone each day, the app speeds up 
every one of those apps by fractions of a second. And over a day, mm. actually, it reduces a lot of friction. So that's why apps were so important. And, you know, Steve Jobs, iPhone, love him or hate him, you know, it is much easier and apps are just generally better, better, better designed as well because they've got, I guess, more budgets developing them. Um, but if you take an app like, I don't know, Just Eat, <laughs> going to sound like an alcoholic now or, or Vivino <laughs> I love Vivino I've got high ratings follow me in Vivino um, they are really uh, apps that are designed and managed by private businesses centralized entities whereas dApps are decentralized apps so your Lloyd's Bank app is a kind of centralized banking app whereas your MetaMask wallet is a decentralized financial dApp. And so you put the D in front of it, you know that actually when you're doing interactions on that dApp, that those actions that might update your profile or update some assets that you have, are actually instead of going to, you know, the database um, of Just Eats, which might be on, you know, Amazon web service or something, the data that's collected in interactions on a dApp are actually being like reconciled on a blockchain, which is a lot to take in. I, I can imagine that must have sounded sort of like quite a lot to sort of take on. But essentially, having that kind of information on blockchains is a lot more censorship resistant and a lot more decentralized than kind of standard centralized private companies and apps. So did that work? Did yeah, you, I think. Does that make <laughs> I think. I think so, and and look, I'll try and say it back, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's a decentralized app, which means that uh, the data or the maybe the protocols that run the app are decentralized, and that they're not stored in one place; they're stored in more than one yeah. computer. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, so, if somebody were to take down, I don't know, let's say a hacker would be able to infiltrate Just Eat's uh, data warehouse shut mm. the whole thing down. Um, you can't shut down a blockchain database because it's copied and distributed across millions of computers across the world. So it's very, very resilient to to that kind of attack. And it has much higher kind of security as well. Well, that, again, neatly brings us on to sort of the next topic, which is the cake and, and some of your projects. And the cake is described on the website as a decentralized support for crypto ecosystems. So what is the cake in basic terms? And what does decentralized support for the crypto ecosystem mean? Okay, cool. Um, so the CAKE actually stands for the Crypto Advocates Knowledge Exchange. Um, I didn't know that. I just thought you were using a cool word. It's a secret. <laughs> well, it was a secret. <laughs> it was a secret, not a secret anymore. Does anybody else know that? Uh, some people know. Those in the know. The ones that need to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm glad I'm part of that now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what is it? It's a collection of trusted crypto experts that have been curated by myself and my team um, based on their level of integrity really is the sort of the highest sort of brand value that we that we hold um, their knowledge their experience and also their ability to uh, interact with potentially non-technical people that um, in a supportive way that can help them understand the questions or the problems that they that they need to kind of figure out. Um, and so it started really because I was getting a lot of the same questions from people about Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, and there were lots of questions that I couldn't answer as well. Um, and through my network of WhatsApp groups and LinkedIn connections, I thought, actually, there's a real need for combating the problem of misinformation. Um, a lot of WhatsApp groups that I were in, that I was in, um, were kind of you know shilling unresearched projects that, frankly, you know, in the middle of a bull run, it's like well, everything's going up, guys, you know, and a lot of like investment advice, and it's like, guys, you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Like these projects are dodgy, and I had to do something about it. Um, the thing that kind of really triggered me, that made me actually start the cake, was uh, my brother-in-law pulled me into one of these WhatsApp groups and there was a lots of like shilling going on. There was one project in particular um, and everybody was aping in and I was like, actually like I, by that point I'd built a little spreadsheet where I would measure crypto projects. I'd look at the team, I'd look at their GitHub commitments, which is how much code they write, how often they write it and who's writing it. 
Um, I'd look at their social media. And within seconds, I was like, this alarm bells. I looked on their company's house. That didn't stack up. I was like, guys, this is really looking like a scam to me. They were like, no, you know, look at how much money I'm making. Look at this screenshot. And I was like, okay. Um, a few of the guys have basically borrowed money to invest, oh. which you should never do for all the <clears throat> listeners out there. Um, my brother-in-law also invested a bunch of money that he probably didn't have. And it turned out to be BitConnect, which for anybody that hasn't heard about BitConnect, it's one of the most prolific Ponzi scams that happened in crypto. And it was bad times, you know, that group went real quiet. Um, one of the instigators of the group left the group without saying anything. Right. Who knows what happened to him? Um, was he encouraging people to buy? Yeah. He was getting referral kickbacks. Oh, you know, wow. Okay. And, and it just wasn't nice and it wasn't pretty. And so I thought, right, that's it. I've had enough of this. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to create a messaging app that cuts out the need to trust people and that will take care of the trust bit. Um, and that's really where the cake started. So it's all about trust, right? Because there have been so many uh, scams and investments and gone wrong. Um, I obviously, my, my day job is to sort of recover those assets. But ultimately, if you can prevent people from being scammed in the first place, all the better. So it, it comes from a place of wanting people to have trust in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because, you know, it's not just about sort of noobs, you know, we cater a lot for either high net worth individuals or small businesses, all the way up to enterprise customers. Um, and if you're not really well versed in some of the technical terms, a supposed consultant can come along mm. and with a bit of smoke and mirrors can be issuing you invoices for a lot of mm -hmm. money. And yeah. you don't actually really know whether they're throwing straight dice or not. Because of my background in tech um, and all the sort of, you know, countless hours that I've worked with architects, backend developers, mm. you know, IT strategists, I'm able to kind of get these uh, advisors, any new advisors that aren't, you know, trusted already and talk to them, interrogate them. And we've kind of, you know, evolved that into almost like a kind of gated onboarding system now where advisors actually have to jump through quite a few hoops. Um, a lot of them will be asked to provide accreditations and then we do that due diligence. So when you need a quick answer with crypto, you don't want to go and do the research because you haven't got time. Um, if you do go and do the research, you're just going to get pulled into rabbit holes. If you jump onto a WhatsApp group, they're faceless people in that group that might just be shilling products. You, there's so many places to go wrong. Don't even get me started <clears> on <throat> Telegram. Um, I get roped into Telegram groups and then get messages. My phone buzzes every two minutes with someone else just sent some message about how to make money. It's and you just try, you try and reject the group or leave and then you get pulled into another one. It's a nightmare. Yeah. So uh, I think the last time I sort of re researched into this, um, $12 million a day are being lost in sort of cryptocurrency scams. Um, and you've got to, got to ask yourself, why is that? Well, the reason that's happening is because there are crazy gains to be made. And I've seen it. Um, and if you're backing the right horse for the right reasons, that project can can remain, it can be evergreen, and you can realize those returns. So with such with 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 you know dangling such a big carrot, mm. people are willing to take the risks without putting in the legwork. Well, I've seen that happen. There was a friend of mine and he he invested in one coin that I'd never heard of, and I think he put about 40 grand in. Yeah, you think crazy. to yourself, what are you doing? Yeah. But it went after a while, he sort of watched it sort of just go up and down a little bit. And it went up to a mill. And another friend said, Well, like cash out, what, what what are you doing? And he said, No, 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 no. I'm just this yeah, next day, two mil. Mm. And he goes, Well, okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hold out. And my friend goes, Why? I just what are you doing? He goes, Well, I'm just gonna wait till I can buy a football club. He's like, well, how much is that? He said, well, I figured out, I think it's about five mil. A couple of days later, it's at pennies. You yeah. think to yourself, well, yeah, there are opportunities to make a lot of money here. But at the same time, you've got to know when to get out and you've got to know when something's a scam and you've got to know whether it's a risk that you want to take or not. So I completely understand and have seen people make lots of money, miss opportunities and get stuck into schemes that they shouldn't really do. Yep, completely. And, you know, another thing that we hear a lot is that, I've missed the boat. And because I've missed the boat with Bitcoin, I then want to take that extra risk to try and make up lost ground. Yeah. And so people come to me, they've never bought any cryptocurrencies, they haven't really learned the basics, and they're like, right, I want, I want to go into XRP. And I'm not, I'm not dissing XRP, I'm just using it mm. as an example that mm. it's slightly more exotic than a safer, more 
trusted Bitcoin or Ethereum or something like mm -hmm. that, or you know, aping into some NFT product. It's like, no, you know, we we do a lot of talking people down off the ledge just to go, look, you can be financially free. You need to have a game plan. You need to have good fundamentals. You need to stick to it. Don't be driven by emotions. Um, and when we do interviews for advisors, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody that has a nice, soft voice of reason <laughs> that can talk these people down off the ledge um, and actually teach them about the fundamentals. And, and once they've gone and got their first crypto, well, actually, you can come back to the cake and go, right, well, I've made a bit of money in my Bitcoin or Ethereum. Mm. What next? Okay, great. Realize, as you say, realize your gains, take your slices off the top. You haven't then lost anything. Then you're kind of using your, you know, your profit. And then you can maybe start looking at some more kind of exotic altcoins, start looking at, you know, Ethereum tokens and that kind of stuff. Okay. Because um, it seems as though, I mean, it may have started where sort of almost born out of frustration where people want to make investment. But I think it's wider than that now, isn't it? It's about sort of people wanting to start completely different projects, not just invest in a coin, but maybe set up their own NFT project. And they come to you and they go, how do we do that? So if someone wanted to, to do that, how does the process on your website work? How do they get in touch with advisors? Mm -hmm. So you can search for advisors. So we've got uh, a really interesting guy on the cake who is a complete NFT and metaverse kind of maniac, a guy called Richard Keyswick. I actually work with him in another business now because I've got to know him. He originally came in as an advisor on the cake. So he'll he's available for people to search for. If you're searching for like metaverse or NFT experts, Rich will come up. Um, he's done a lot of work in the space. And so you can chat to him about that kind of stuff. And he'll, again, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll do it with the fundamentals. He'll go through the process, figure out what you want, where you want to get to, what your plan is, and then help you along that journey. Um, and, you know, that's the same for, you know, experts like yourself, whether it's um, retrieving crypto funds, legal support. Um, we've got a really good base of advisors on there. Um, and actually currently just sort of doubling down on that, you know, we're not actively growing that advisor network at the rate in which we were before. Yeah. We're now trying to bring more users into the cake to actually realize that benefit. Um, yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. So is the cake for novices, professionals, who is it for? So we break it down into sort of like four go-to markets. So there's people that need crypto because their systems are corrupt. Okay. Um, so these people, um, there's there's a lot of volume there. There's a lot of scale for that kind of user type. They find it almost impossible to retain value because their their banking systems or their governments are actually debasing their currencies so much that the price of bread has gone up four hundred thousand percent, and they're basically being robbed. Right. They are desperate. They actually need crypto. Like most people in Europe, most aff affluent countries, they don't need crypto. Okay. These people need it to survive, to trade, and to you know feed their kids and retain mm -hmm. value and ex exchange value between themselves. That's go to market one. Go to market two are the type of people that want crypto, but they're still too cautious. So they might have, you know, bowed mouth Bitcoin a few years ago. Now they're mm -hmm. too stubborn to kind of, you know, flip and, and go and get some. And so these people will need reassurance content. There's a lot of volume there for those type of people. These are kind of like no coiners, they're also called. Um, go to market three are the people that get it. Okay, I've got crypto. I know it's not a scam. Hey, sometimes it goes up. That's really cool. Um, they want to protect that wealth. They want to double down on it. They might want help from crypto ex uh, tax experts or legal experts. Yeah. And they might want to know what to do yeah, with their taxation, for example. They might want to know what's the next project that I can jump on. With those type of users, you know, we don't need to do the full education piece. They're already in the boat and they're, and they're off. They just need to know what projects are interesting, where's the market going, where's the macro effect going. Um, and then the fourth one is businesses. So businesses that actually have to have trusted advice because their business relies on it. There might be tax implications. They might be building Web3 apps. They might need blockchain architecture. They might need development. They need to understand the really complex issues. And so a lot of the advisors on the cake are at that level. People that can really talk to them at whatever stage of their crypto journey they're at and really focus down on some of the really technical details or some of the more uh, kind of regulatory uh, 
details that you know people like you are going to be familiar with. So it's a matter of providing a service and a, a sort of a link up to professionals for people from all the way at the bottom who don't really know too much all the way to the very top where it's professionals who need real, real advice. Yeah, exactly. Um, and at the moment, like this is a great time to sort of use the case because at the moment we haven't, you know, built in our tokenized incentive system, which is something that we can sort of talk about in a bit, if you like. Um, all the advisors on the cake actually reply to chats because they they like the project and they think it's needed and they're actually happy to, to help people on that journey. Um, corporates and business users and high net worth individuals will be able to at some point subscribe to the cake in which case they'll get access to the kind of high niche topic experts um, that businesses need so actually what that does is it allows them to get that kind of always on support for them and their teams um, and it also allows the sort of go-to-market ones and twos to get a lot of that support for free because that's how the kind of the business model yeah, it makes sense. Well, yeah. Makes sense. Well, I can tell people from my experience of, of being an advisor on the cake that normally what happens is someone gets in contact with me. I get a message um, via a specific chat room that is is sort of in the ecosphere of the cake. And then I'm able to respond to them directly. So Ben sort of allows me to, to sort of market myself to some extent on the website. And I'm able to interact with them directly, um, which means that there's there's no barrier to just accessing potential clients or people who want real advice. So in that respect, it's it's a really easy way to help people in the space. Mm. To move on a little bit, you describe the cake as, as a DAO. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, so DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Um, and what is a DAO? Well, it's not, it's not a quick answer. <laughs> But I'll try and make it succinct. I'll try and, I'll try and keep it simple. Um, a DAO is like a normal business or organization. Um, but think of a business that's kind of almost run on a social networking app. It's community driven. Um, in the same way that if you're on like an organized Discord group or an organized Telegram group, um, for a crypto project it's kind of self-organizing and the people in those groups support the project in the same way that the people working businesses support the business i like the idea i like the company I like the founders i'm going to go and work for them um but they're actually able to purchase tokens or hold nfts and use those as voting mechanisms so there could be a proposal drafted by one of the community members and everybody that's holding tokens gets to vote on that. So it's kind of like a democratic uh, business model, if you like, or business structure. Um, and one of the kind of, I guess, key attributes of a DAO is transparency. So the code that runs the app or DAP will be on GitHub. And people are proud of that. Like, here's our GitHub. Go look at the code. There's nothing malicious in there. Um, whereas a traditional business would never put their code on a website. No, well, they, they never share the, the basic information because that's, that's right. business secrecy, right? That's yeah. private. And it's really hard for like traditional business people to get their head around that. Why would we share? Well, because it actually inspires more trust, like genuinely. Um, and that's the cool thing about how blockchain businesses evolve really quickly because, you know, apart from Ethereum, um, before that, you know, all the other coins after Bitcoin that was open source code. It was, it was, you know, it was almost a down away. You know, they 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 were self organizing. Um, they wrote the code, and they published it. And a load of coins going, oh cool, we don't have to do any work. We just copy and paste that and start our own community. Um, the thing that makes it a DAO really is the sort of voting mechanisms. It allows you know on chain verification of ideas that have sort of um, been incepted and passed, and you can kind of see that. Um, you know, nobody at the top has really sort of overthrown that. So <clears throat> to put that in the context of the cake, at the moment, we've got myself, we've got our chores, we've got Alex, we've got Adriano, Tiana. You know, we make the decisions in the business to the best of our knowledge. Um, but we've also got 70 advisors who are far cleverer than us. Uh, a lot of them have expertise that we don't have. And we want to allow them to participate. Um, they're trusted. And the more trusted they are by the users, by other Cake members, um, the more, I guess, peer reviews or social um, credentials or uh, uh, 
social proofing that they've got would actually allow them access, not just from a, tr a trusted uh, advisory perspective, but actually to having a seat at the table um, where they can go, actually, I've got a proposal, what do you guys think? They can put it forwards, we can vote on it, and if the vote passes, it's going to happen. And a lot of the time, the um, properties of that proposal are actually predefined in smart contracts. So here's a really bad example. You might say, okay, we're weather Dow. And I propose that if we have three of the hottest days in succession this year, we should donate 3% of our tokens to Rwanda drought charity. Mm -hmm. And here's the contract address. You can write that into a smart contract. And if the Oracle data services confirm that that weather data is correct, it would automatically initiate. The vote was passed, the smart contract's programmed, and it just happens. And you can't stop it. And it's kind of terrifying, but also really cool at the same time. So it, it, it makes a democracy of decision making. So normal business structures, the people at the top make the decisions. In this case, everybody is at least able to propose a change. Yeah. And then you vote on it in a democratic way. Well, yeah. And the thing that makes that, you know, in a DAO, the thing that makes it autonomous is the fact that you've discussed the scenario, you've discussed the outcomes, you've programmed it into smart contract, it's on the blockchain, no one can change it. And if that thing happens, it automates, it's automated. And that's what's cool about it. So you can, like code does it. I suppose you need someone to go in and go, right, get the money, give it to the charity. It's like, it's all set up. Yeah, the bureaucracy of running a company and all the things that slow it down, it's done automatically. Yeah. Could you at some point then say, we're going to do this and then late, and obviously that forms part of the code. And then later on you could say, well, actually we don't want to do that anymore. So the process would be that it does it and then undoes it later. I don't think so. No? No, I think, you know, if it was immutable and the, and the scenario was agreed by the DAO and it's written into the contract, you can't change the contract and you can't change it. Right. If you were to say, okay, we'll put a clause in this smart contract, whereas um, a, if a vote can be passed and a majority vote happens, then the, the contract will be updated. So with like when you're creating <coughs> like tokenomics designs for, for businesses, you can like hard cap the supply and you can create the contract so it can't be updated. And that means once it's published on chain, like you can't, you can't change it. Whereas some projects like XRP or others <laughs> that can just add millions to supply if they want to, <laughs> um, they can then just go in and just like, oh, okay, well, yeah, it's on chain, but we can change it. So it, can, it doesn't make it law. Mm. Like that's one of, I guess, the kind of go golden rules of crypto is that like code is law. Okay. And I ask this question a lot of people when I talk about DAOs, but there seems to be sort of two schools of thought, especially legally, in terms of liability. Because ultimately, if you go after a DAO because it's acted in a certain way, who are you suing? Now, there's an English case, Tulip Trading, where coders or, or people who designed the code were held not to have a, a duty to the people who rely on that code. Whereas in America, there is a... a, a a current case whereby uh, a DAO is being sued, but actually who's being sued is those who hold the governance tokens. Mm. Which method would you prefer? Which school of thought do you think we should, sh I suppose, which school of thought should we follow? Or do you have a strong opinion on that? I've got really strong opinions and, I, and I'll choose my words carefully. Um, for me, we wouldn't have the freedom of blockchain money if we would have invited certain parties or governments to the table for that conversation. Um, if you look back at the history books, you know, when the first Bitcoin blocks were being mined, there was code in there that Satoshi had admin keys to it. And as it started taking off, and I generally think that they didn't know if this was going to work or not, as it started to gain traction and more miners started installing, you know, the Bitcoin core code and running it, it's like, oh my God, this is, it's happening, guys. Like, um, and one of the last messages from Satoshi was like, you know, I'm starting to get undue attention. And he updated the contract to remove the admin keys. And he goes, right, no one can change this now. This is pure consensus. It's the miners that decide what version of the software they run. And shortly after that, he just disappeared. Mm. Um, why was that? You know, one school of thought is that, you know, acting bodies of control 
weren't happy about that because it challenged their ability to protect and govern and control. And again, we get back onto that sort of libertarian kind of side of it now. Um, I think that, you know, DAOs are regulation 2.0 and I would love it if governments would allow these people who are trying to improve on what's been done before the time and space to create community regulation that can eventually be retrofitted and help those systems, you know, to, to move forward. Give them the space instead of trying to put the fire out before it's had time to breathe. You know, there are malicious actors in the space, but nothing compared to the people that actually want to do it for the right reasons. And so you've always got this like friction point where Web3 communities and developers and people that are building stuff intersect with governments and compliance. And a lot of the time there's, there's a disconnect there because they want different things. And so, you know, I guess the short answer is, you know, should DAOs be regulated? <clears throat> Not yet. I think, you know, unless they're really, you know, triggering things that are really, really bad, just engage with them, talk to them and learn. And that's hopefully touch words where our government is going, you know, mm. instead of a snuff it out and kill it approach, which you get a lot in the States yeah. is talk to them, learn and, and realize what they're trying to do. Um, I think we could have a whole separate recording on DAOs. And I think we should at some point get you back to talk about DAOs. Let's do it. <laughs> but let's not focus too much on that today. And thank you for that. And that's, that's, that's really interesting. In terms of sort of looking at the cake, one of the things that you talk about is DSUP. Mm. What's that? DSUP, again, another acronym, stands for... <laughs> good acronym. Decentralized Support Token. Okay. Yeah. So that's your token? It's the utility. Or the proposed token. token? Is it up and running at the moment or not? Uh, we've got it on testnet. So we're... Yeah, we are developing um, Solidity code that allows engagement with that token. So it's something that we're working on. Okay. Um, it's something that's really complicated. And it had to be complicated because we looked at the mechanics of it and it's not something that you can do very easily. You need to think about the market dynamics. You need to think about supply and demand. You need to think about securities laws as well. Much as I kind of, you know, want to try and sidestep that, it is a consideration and we mm -hmm. have had advice on that. Um, and, you know, it is the token... If you think about it, like the cost of creating a token is almost zero. The cost to develop an app that uses it is not zero. That's expensive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where, that's why people just fork tokens and try and shill them and try and scam and make loads of money. But the people that are actually building stuff that has utility, they're the people that are kind of hopefully changing the world and, and improving. Yeah. And so I think... All businesses in the future will be tokenized. I think it's, you know, even if you just take, you know, stock stocks and shares of businesses, it's a far better way of doing it. So that's just a complete no-brainer for me that's going to happen. All businesses will be tokenized. Um, and then the mechanics within those businesses, the stuff we're talking about, DAOs, will then utilize those tokens or NFTs as part of the, um, you know, attributes and properties that run the code that is the business. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, th these concepts are are difficult in in th sort of theory because it sort of involves computer language and coding language. But does it ultimately mean that the more tokens you have, the the more able you are to influence a vote, or the more uh, the more rights you have? Is that how it works? Well, in the DAO mechanism, yes. Um, but in the sort of general day to day utility of the code, no. Um, so we want advisors to um, be um, remunerate, remunerated. Is that right? <laughs> I can never say that word. What's the word, Matt? You're a clever guy. Uh, compensated. Compensated, right? Um, or remunerated? Yeah. But I thought I would also mess it up there, so I went for I went for a small break to think about it. Um, and how does the token play into that? Well, when advisors register on the cake, they get like a baseline social graph profile. Yep. Um, if an advisor like yourself has sort of demonstrated that they've got 
long social reach, they're in the public eye, they've got a strong profile that actually is their brand and is their sort of, you know, I guess their, you know, their career. Um, we take that into account. And so we've got different angles that build up an advisor's social graph. So um, social proofing, um, cake DAO validation of other cake members that are either in the network or, or know the know the experts. Um, how quickly they are to respond to chats. So, you know, analytics and, and, and um, interaction based. These will build up a multiplier. And the higher the multiplier, the more tokens that are attributed to that advisor. So we use the DSUP as a leaderboard system. So the advisors that have the most DSUP attributed to them um, are going to be the ones that uh, have the highest multiplier. And uh, obviously these attributes uh, combine to allow users to make the right decision. So if you're coming onto the cake and you want to talk about, I don't know, crypto and energy and how can my business use blockchain technology to be more energy um, efficient or, or to be more env environmentally friendly, um, you might get three or four different search results on the cake. You'll be able to look at their social score and their DSUP attribution, and that will tell you actually basically how good they are in a nutshell. So I suppose the better advisor you are, the more tokens you're going to have is, is when it, that's how you boil it down. Yeah. And there's different systems that allow you to determine uh, whether you're a good advisor or not, but that's what it boils down to. Pretty much, yeah. And obviously, like building that like isn't easy, but we we're building it, and we've got a really cool team um, who are working on that. Um, and yeah, recently got a new CTO, which is really awesome. Yeah, nice. Um, and we're actually designing an app at the moment. So a want... app. It will start as an app, <laughs> and then when the sort of when the tokenized incentive system plugs into it, yeah. then it will become a DAP. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So that was sort of my next question. What are your plans for the cake? What's the mission? Yeah, so, you know, I've sort of like personally sort of like carried this project for a long time. I've invested a lot of, you know, time and money and sweat and blood and tears into it. Um, we're at a point now where we're ready to sort of like go to mass market with it. So we are doing a, an investment round. Um, we had um, a conversation a few months ago. This was kind of before the bear market kicked in. Um, and we just started doing our kind of investor outreach. Um, and I guess, you know, we weren't really ex expecting much very quickly, but we were given a really nice um, head of term sheets from VC for quite a lot of money. And we were like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> Thanks very we much. We don't need anywhere near that amount of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We only need this amount of money. Um, and so we said, okay, look, if, if we can get that interest that quickly, why don't we go redo our to tokenomics, increase our seed round? So that's kind of what we're doing at the moment. We're building out our kind of vesting contract. And for anybody that's not familiar with a vesting contract, it allows investors that do token buys to, instead of sending Ethereum or stable coins to, you know, a project, project founder's wallet, they actually send it into a smart contract. And what that means is it kind of de-risks it. So you can obviously look at the smart contract, you can see what the code is doing with it. Um, and so they'll send funds into that smart contract. They'll have to... Um, vest those those tokens mm. for a certain period of time 12 months for example um and then those funds will be released to them in an automated fashion the smart contract will release them and that is kind of really to stabilize the token so investors kind of you know we're not a pump and dump project obviously yeah. we want investors you know that get the project they like the idea and that we ultimately would want them to hold the tokens which will help the value of the token go up over time as the demand economics increase, more users come into the cake. That utilizes the treasury tokens that are held in the contract. Um, those tokens are then um, pushed through the mechanics that are then sort of distributed and attributed to those advisors. So that's how it works. So when the... Um, advisor hopefully gets a positive review or in fact any positive interaction on the platform from a user or customer's perspective is that a bunch of those tokens are banned so the token deflationary right so okay we try and build out these deflationary mechanisms to have a healthy supply and demand kind of balance and that's why our coo our chores grace is actually doing work with Baltic Air at the moment, doing their first NFT flight tickets is like the token guru. 
Doing, <laughs> sorry, he's doing NFT flight tickets. Yeah. What does that mean? It basically means that you can kind of um, hold an NFT and get benefits from it. Um, oh, it's like the sort of the sports ones where you buy an NFT and you get access to certain content and videos and kind of like, air, get like, like a, air, miles. air miles. And yeah. I don't want to like describe it too much because he knows <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, day. yeah, fair. Um, but he sort of like came along and looked at my tokenomics and he's like, yeah, you need to update this. And I was like, okay. So we looked at it in detail. And that's why I sort of going back to like, you know, what are the next steps, you know, figuring out the roadmap and the technical roadmap mm. is just really fun because... You know, I've been doing this for years and this is just so much harder. <laughs> and it's kind of like masochistically kind of like enjoyable to sort of figure this stuff out. Um, but in terms of sort of the other other parts of, of the cake, I suppose some of it's, or at least a lot of it's about education. So how much of your mission is centered around education and how do you look to educate people? Yeah, it is, you know, an education platform. Um, it comes from a place of sort of, you know, great... Uh, personal effect really you know I talked about sort of leaving school early um, and that was because I wasn't able to convert that education into something useful hmm. it just didn't work for me I wasn't right for their system and so you know when I started coming up with the idea of the cake it really was to free up education and to make it accessible and because crypto and blockchain is inherently hard and complex i wanted something that kind of disarmed that and allowed anybody to educate themselves with a view to either becoming financially free or being able to run a crypto business or be able to benefit from blockchain or you know help the world in the ways that blockchain is really designed to do. Does that mean that you'll be publishing certain articles? I mean, I, I look at some exchanges, right? I think Coinbase is pretty good for this. They, they sort of publish, you know, what is a crypto asset? What is Bitcoin? What, what are private keys? Is that the sort of tactic you want to go down to educate people via articles or is it mainly through the advisors? So we do do articles. Um, and if you go on the cake.chat, you'll find really useful articles. Um, one of our advisors, who I think one of the first advisors on the cake, are called Brendan Brown. Um, he lectures about crypto and blockchain at universities in America. He is one of those guys that is just a safe pair of hands, a lovely guy to talk to, um, but he's got a lot of information and educational material about privacy and security. So we've done articles on that. But the unique selling point for the cake is that you don't have to spend the time finding the article, reading the article, and getting the bit that you want from that article when you can just go onto the cake, type in exactly what you want, <laughs> True, yeah. have an advisor go, I already know that and I'm trusted, bang, there's the answer. So instead of doing your own research, you can just go and ask somebody because they're available. Yeah, right. Because really like one easy. of the first rule of crypto is like, do your own research. It's like, well, doing your own research is not that easy because first you have to learn what the search term is and then you have to find the content and then you have to trust the content. And then when you're assuming the content, you're getting blasted by ads and you go, oh, wow, look, NFTs. And then you're somewhere else. Yeah. And then you're in a WhatsApp group and then you're getting scammed. So, you know, hopefully this solves a lot of that and removes a lot of that friction and doubt. And rehumanizes it, I suppose, because instead of it sort of being content on your computer, phone screen, whatever, you can actually speak to a human being who you've already vetted. Yeah. That's the whole I, point, right? I love the fact that you've sort of like mentioned that, you know, WhatsApp groups and Telegram groups have, yeah, WhatsApp doesn't even have pictures of people most of the time. And Telegram just has, you know, NFT pictures, you know, the cake cuts through that. You can see their pictures, most profiles on the cake, you can see you can see their faces, they're real people with their real names. At the moment, we've still even got their LinkedIn links on there. So you can go and check them out yourself. Like we will remove that eventually because we obviously want to kind of like, you know, sell subscriptions to it. Mm. But we'll prove to you that these advisors are trusted on Twitter. Maybe they've got a blue check. Maybe they've got 2000 followers on LinkedIn. Yeah. You know, maybe they're talking at big crypto events, you know. We'll have our proprietary, you know, social scoring algorithms that will allow you to know that it's trusted without having to kind of go and even research themselves. So that's oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Sort of slightly sort of left field now, what decentralized project do you like at the moment? What's, what's of real interest? I see a lot of projects. I see a lot of um, deal flow and a lot of footfall. Um, and a lot of the times I can look at them very quickly and just go, meh. Like with the whole like NFT space, yeah, 
art for art's sake, I think is great. If you actually, you know, want to make money from it, then I guess potentially you're in it for the wrong reasons. Like, um, that sounds quite negative, but it's a bit like the difference between like the British music industry and like a European music industry like, like Berlin, for example. So mm. in Berlin, you don't have to be good at music or good at art to get paid by the government. You just go, hey, I did this gallery event, pay me money. And they're like, yeah, art and culture, here's money. Whereas in the UK, if you want to be good in a band, and I'm saying this because <laughs> I was in a band and, and, and we did quite well and we did tour. And so I did get to kind of see that is that you play that music because you love it and you want people to hear it. Promoters in the UK, they say, oh, well, you know, you won't get any money off the door unless you bring 30 people in. So like bands are losing money mm. to get people to listen to it. Whereas in Europe, the government's paying them. So the quality is, that's why Britain's got the best music. Well, this is your opportunity yeah. to tell everyone what band you're in. The band was called King Punch. Okay. It was a ska punk band. We did pretty well. We toured a few times. We played in Canada to like 7,000 people. That's really good. Yeah. It's a good show. We'll try and find some links to you on Spotify. Is all the music yep. on there or, or yep. Apple? Or, yeah, yep. we'll, we'll try and it's find some everywhere. links. It's everywhere. Um, but so what projects do I like? So there is one project that I want to talk about. Um, I feel really passionate about it. It's called <laughs> Nemus.Earth. So N-E-M-U-S mm -hmm. dot Earth. And these guys have got a really good um, idea. They're trying to, well, they are um, buying up patches of the Amazon and they're tokenizing those patches as NFTs. And if you buy one, you're actually safeguarding some of the Amazon and you can go onto their DAP and you can look at your little, your little square and zoom into it and see the actual bit of Amazon that you own. Who is selling the land in Amazon? You may not know the answer because you don't work there, but to me, it's a matter of thinking like, how do I know that the NFT I've bought actually attaches to something real? Maybe you don't know the answer to that because you actually, don't work there. I actually don't know the answer to that. And it could be a complete scam project. But I don't think, <laughs> yeah, it, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't think it is. Um, I just like the idea. I just like the fact that like, instead of somebody going, hey, buy this NFT, it's like, why? Yeah. It's like, do you care about saving the Amazon? Yes, then here's the way to do it. Like, Here's a really nice application of blockchain tech that can allow all this money that's flowing into crypto hmm. to do something really good. And like, that's what, you know, Bitcoin was designed to do is, you know, designed to help. And this project is really doing that. So that's really cool. Um, I really like that. No, that's a great example because it's a, a sort of real world application of people using blockchain to do some good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of other projects, what, what have you got going on? Because I know that there's lots in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, I just finished a contract at Beyond, who uh, a London kind of like design, production and branding agency. Um I can't talk too much about this project because they haven't launched it yet and we've just finished designing it. But the client is called Proxy okay. and they are designing a really cool wallet. And when you think of a wallet, you think of um, a dApp that you can hold your coins and NFTs in and it does do that. Um, but you can also use it to secure your privacy which is obviously another massive kind of driving force that, that crypto, you know, has kind of evolved from. Um, let's say you want to go to a really swanky NFT event in New York um, and you can only get in if you've got a bored ape, okay? You need to prove to the guy on the door mm -hmm. that you own that bored ape, but you don't want to... Um, show them your wallet because you don't want to dox yourself. You don't want people looking at your bank account. You know, nobody, nobody wants that. So you can kind of spin up a QR code in the app that will prove that you have a board ape, um, but it doesn't share the wallet address with you. So it so, shows enough to show ownership, but not enough for, as you say, people to be doxed in any way. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you've heard us talk about Crypto Club Global. They're really cool. Um, you know, they crowdfunded the ownership of Blacks on Dean Street in Soho, yep. which is classic sort of members club. Um, in order to get in there, I use an app called Token Proof. And I've already linked in my NFT membership into this Token Proof app. So when I go in, the guy at the door scans my QR code. He doesn't know my name. He doesn't know my email address. He hasn't got my bank details. He doesn't know my blood type. He doesn't even know my crypto wallet address. All he knows is that the app has told him that I have that NFT. And that's right. just so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that just gives you access and that's it. 
Yeah, you, it, you don't need to prove anything else at that stage. Exactly, yeah. That's awesome. Ben, thank you so much. You've been awesome. Really, really appreciate it. I'm going to have to get you in again to talk about all the other things that you're super knowledgeable about. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That was a great conversation. really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to catching you out on the crypto scene in London and beyond. Yeah, Ben is always doing conferences and speaking very eloquently about all sorts of things. So I'm sure you'll see him around. This podcast does not contain any financial or legal advice, and you should not seek to rely on it as such. Opinions are the individual's own. This podcast was produced and edited by Joe Hawkins and music by Luke Carey. Thank you for listening and see you next time.